morning. If you have your Bibles, can you please turn to Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 35. So if you have a Bible, there's a Bible underneath your chair. It'll be Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 35. As you turn there in your Bibles, I'm going to pray for it today. Dear Lord, thank you so much, God, for all of your blessings in our lives. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for your majesty. God, I just thank you for a church that loves you, Lord, and that loves each other. Lord, as we dive into your word today, I pray that you would lead and guide us, Lord. And Lord, let everything we do honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Romans 8, chapter, or Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 35, it says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, we will be, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That passage of Scripture will be the theme for the next several weeks. Verses 37 is kind of the, the full point of it, is we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We are more than a conqueror. I love that picture. You think of a conqueror, somebody that's victorious. We are more than that through Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's listed. Paul lists off all these things, famine, persecution, danger. Through all that, we are more than conquerors. But as I think about this, there's some things in our life that makes us feel like we're not conquerors. There's things that happen in our lives that make us not feel like a conqueror. Sin is one thing in our life that can make us not feel conquerors. When we sin, if we're stuck in a lifestyle of sin, we feel guilty. Fear. If you struggle with fear, fear just controls you. You don't feel like a conqueror. Doubt. If you have doubts and doubts just invade you, you don't feel like more than a conqueror. So over these next several weeks, we're going to look at how do we become more than conquerors. I believe that's what God's plan is for our lives, is to be more than conquerors. And how is it done? So the first thing we're going to look at today is sin. I know it's not the, the best subject to start with, but it's sin. It's something that I believe sometimes has a stronghold on people. Do you know that 70% of men in churches view pornography? 70% of men in the American church today view pornography. Fear, doubt, anger, divorce, greed, strife, all continue in the church body. And the difference is we all sin. I still sin. We struggle with sin. But the difference is being subjects and almost being a slave to sin. There's sometimes where sin almost controls us, or fear almost controls us, or sexual lust almost controls us. And we feel like we just can't get out of it. And I feel like this. Francis Chan put it this way. So you have these two drinks. I got myself some from... Um, lemonade type of drink. Um, really good. Anybody like lemonade? A couple people? Okay, I know some people are going to like this stuff. So. Anybody like the Starbucks mocha drinks? Yes, these things are addictive. Okay, so you got these two drinks here. And let's just say one is Jesus and one is sin, okay? And sometimes this is how we live our lives. So I wake up in the morning, man, I want to get me in the Word today. I want to get myself some Jesus. Mmm. Ah, Jesus is good. Oh, man, I want to, I don't know, smoke pot. I don't know. I don't know what you guys do. Well, <laughs> man, I want to I wanna pray. I want to see God today. Oh, man, I look at, I don't know, something bad. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So this, sometimes this is how we live our lives. Man, I'm going to be awake today. This is... This is how we live our life sometimes. It's going back and forth. But you say, well, Tim, that's not me, you know. That's not really how I am. I don't go back and forth. But some things can be controlling. Let's just say you struggle with one thing, one sin. It could be lust. It could be gossiping. It could be a greed, a love of money. It could be coveting. Whatever it is, this is one thing that controls you. And what happens is this. It's that one thing that pollutes your whole walk with Christ. And it always is kind of hanging on you. It always is kind of with you. And yes, I am going to drink this for you guys. So you well remember. Oh, that's just wrong. Oh. 
Oh, dear. I really love you guys, all right? <laughs> and it pollutes the whole drink. It pollutes the whole experience. And I feel like Christians sometimes live this type of life where, the, yes, they love Christ. They're for Jesus. They want to know him, but yet they got this one sin, or they got this area in this life that's controlling them, and they don't know how to get free from it. In my life, I experienced this. I grew up in a, in a Christian home. I grew up um, with godly parents, but there was this one sin that I couldn't shake myself free from. I would do good for a period of time. I would strive to do good, but eventually I'd fall right back into that sin. Then I'd do good, and then I'd fall right back in. I felt like I was almost subject, almost a slave to this sin in my life. We're going to be looking at the life of David. We're going to look at the life of David for the next several weeks. We're going to look at where David conquered and when he failed, and how can we relate it to our life. And the, the number one story that you think of when you think of David is David and Goliath, David and Goliath. So I thought, how much better to start with David and Goliath? But most of you are like, Tim, come on, I heard this in VBS. I don't need to hear it again. But when we look at David and Goliath, this is how we usually view it. We usually put ourselves in as David. We look at David versus his Goliath, and then some guy gives you a rah-rah speech on how to be like David and defeat your Goliath, right? You've all probably heard that sermon before, how to de- defeat your Goliath. But today we're going to look at it kind of differently. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and yes, we're going to read the story today. I'm not going to put it on the screen, so you have to do some work. I can watch everybody. 1 Samuel chapter 17, okay? Starting with verse 1. And as you turn there, I'll give you a little context what's going on here. Israel wanted a king. They wanted to be governed by somebody. So they chose Saul to govern them. They chose Saul as their king. Saul was appointed as king, but over time, Saul ended up sinning and disobeying God. So God's hand was taken off of Saul. And then so God told Samuel, the prophet, go anoint me a king, somebody that is worthy. And so Samuel goes to the house of Jesse and anoints David as king. Before David fought Goliath, he was actually anointed king. I don't know if you knew that. He was actually anointed to be king. So David becomes anointed king at this time. But then David goes back into the fields. He serves the sheep. He serves his father. He actually serves in Saul's castle for a period of time. And that's where we pick up this story. So so David is the servant. Saul's the king. But David is the anointed king. So 1 Samuel chapter 17 says this. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokoh and Judah. They pitched their camp between Sokoh and Eskah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Valley of Elam and drew their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill, the Israelites another, with the valley between them. So what you have here is your class of good versus evil. You got the good Israelites versus the bad Philistines, and there's this valley in between them. A champion named Goliath, who, who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. Its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So what happens here is they send out their champion, their, their Michael Jordan, their number one guy. They send him out. It's Goliath, and he's this massive man. Some scholars believe he's between 7 feet and 9 feet. Um, The armor that he wore was actually too heavy for any of us to wear nowadays. It's just way too much. So this is a gigantic of a man coming out. Verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you are not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So he comes out, Goliath, and starts um, taunting them, challenging them. And they see this gigantic man, and they become terrified. And Saul, the king, is hiding, and they're scared. So I'll summarize the next several verses. David comes bringing food for his brothers. And he sees Goliath, and he, th- he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? And David kind of gets upset at what he sees. He gets, he gets mad at this, and his brothers just try to calm him down. But David, he want, David wants to pick a fight with this guy. So then David goes to Saul and says, listen, I want, I'll fight. I'll, I'll go fight this Philistine. 
And, you know, Saul's looking at him and thinking, that's just ridiculous. Who do you think you are? You're just a boy. You're just a shepherd. But David insists, I can fight this. I fought the lion. I fought the bear. I can fight this Goliath. So then Saul, what does he try to do? He tries to make David look like a warrior. He tries to make him look like a champion. But David said, that's just not me. So then David goes out and faces Goliath. Now skip down to verse 40. Go down to verse 40. So this is David now after he leaves Saul. He says, Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his pouch in the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with the shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked at David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I will give you to the flesh of the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give you the carcass and the Philistine army to the birds and to the wild animals and to the and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag he, and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, without a sword in his hand, struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran over to him, took hold of the Philistine sword, drew it from its sheath after he killed him and cut off the head with a sword. Now who has heard this story? Put your hand in the air if you've heard this story before. Everybody's heard this story before. When I've heard this story, I used to get so frustrated. I used to get so upset. I used to get so mad because I, I, I try to be David. I don't know if you've been in this situation. You have sin, you have fear, you have doubt, you have this Goliath in your life, whatever it could be, and you try to be David. You try to muster up this, this strength somehow to defeat it. And you, and you try, and I remember trying so hard. I was at those youth group times, you know, where you would um, burn CDs because they were evil or something. And actually, actually, it's cassette tapes. It wasn't A-track tapes, but, you know, we'd, we'd burn our bad CDs. We'd try to be good, and we wouldn't watch any R-rated movies unless it was about Jesus dying on the cross. You know, we, would, we were just trying to be good. And I remember just trying and striving and striving. And next thing you know, I fell right back into sin. And then I would try and try again, and I would just, I remember just, just grinding my teeth because I was like, I'm going to defeat this Goliath in my life. I'm going to defeat it. And every time, I'd fail, and I'd fail, and I'd fail. And my Goliath in my life became bigger and bigger and bigger. And it became so frustrating to me because I love God. I love Jesus. Why can't I defeat this Goliath? Why can't I be like David? I mean, David did it. Why can't I do it? And it used to frustrate me. But now when I look at the story, I see it differently. See, there's two ways to look at Scripture. First way of looking at Scripture is how we often look at Scripture is that we, it's a road map that the stories apply to us. So we read about David, so we put ourselves in as David, or we read about Esther, Ruth, and we put ourselves in them. Then there's a second way. According to Luke 24, Jesus says that Mo through the Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, it's all about me. So when I view this story now, I see Jesus in as David. I don't see myself. You know who I see myself as? Saul. I see myself as the scared Israelites on the other side, and I see Jesus in this place. It's a perfect picture of the gospel. There's this ultimate foe. There's this Philistine, this ultimate foe. And they needed a champion. They needed somebody to come and save them. And who comes? A little, a little shepherd boy. A little boy from no man's land. And who, who do you think you are? And it reminds me of Jesus. Jesus came as a baby in a manger from no man's land in Nazareth. And he comes and people are saying, who do you think you are, Jesus? And they're looking at David the same way. Who do you think you are? And David says, I don't need to look like a champion. I don't need to look like it because I know my mission. And it's the same picture of Jesus. See, what we'd have to realize something is this. We often say it's David versus Goliath. It actually should be Saul versus Goliath. That's what this story should be called. Saul versus Goliath. You know whose fault, whose problem Goliath is? It's Saul's. It's not David's. Saul's the king. 
Saul, Saul's, Saul's the leader. He's their captain. This, he should be the one fighting. He should be the one battling. But what do we find Saul doing? He's scared. Our sin, our giants, our fear, our doubts are from a fallen world. And you know whose problem is? Ours. It's our problem. It's ours. Those are our giants. Those are our things. That's what we have to conquer. And we try to do it in ourselves. We try to muster up something in ourselves to defeat sin, to defeat the things before us, to try to conquer fear or doubt. We try to motivate ourselves to do it, and we fall. We fall continually over and over because we, we were taught from a young age, you know, if you make a mess, you clean the mess. If you, make, if you sin, it's your problem, and we try to muster up something and change. But what's so beautiful about this picture is that David takes Saul's place. David takes the place of Saul. Saul should be out there. Saul should be fighting Goliath, but David exchanges with him because David is the true anointed king. He's the true one that can handle this. So David takes the place, and as we know, he goes and fights Goliath. And whoever lost, the loser, would be subject to the other one. Christians sometimes walk around subject to sin. They walk around enslaved to sin. They walk around enslaved to fear, enslaved to doubt. They feel like, they, like their Goliath has defeated them. They feel like they are they're in, in bondage with it. But you know what Romans 6, 18 says? You have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. You have been set free. So when David killed Goliath, when he just destroyed their champion, instantly the Philistines were underneath the Israelites' control. You see, when Jesus defeated Satan on the cross, instantly death was under his feet. Sin was under his feet. And I love what David does. David goes over and he finishes the work. He goes over, he runs, he runs over to Goliath after he hits him with a stone. He takes out his sword and cuts off his head. This reminds me of Jesus on the cross. Jesus says, it is finished. It is finished. So what does this mean for us? It's a picture of the gospel. So how can we apply this to our lives? What does this look like? Well, it looks like this. We have to take our focus off the giants and put our focus on our champion. We have to take our focus off our obstacles. If you deal with greed, lust, gossiping, anger, if you struggle with anger, you have to take your focus off your issues and put your focus on your champion, Jesus. That is what it looks like to switch the viewpoint. We sometimes get comfortable in who we are. We sometimes get comfortable in our sin. I've heard often people say, well, you know, I'm just, I, I, I just get angry. I'm just an angry person. That's just who I am. That's just who I am. Or you know what, Tim? I'm, I'm stuck in lust. This is, just, this is just part of me. God's plan is not that for you. God's plan is to give you life and life more abundantly. My favorite part of the whole story of David and Goliath is verse 52. This is my favorite part of the whole story. If you can look at verse 52. So after David cuts off the head of Goliath, the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, and they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the road of Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. I love this picture because here the Israelites were scared. They, 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 they were insecure. They didn't have what it took to fight. Suddenly they watched their champion defeat it. They watched their champion defeat their champion and they got motivated. They got excited and they gave a shout. They got so excited that they chased down the rest of the Philistine army and destroyed them. And then they went and plundered their camp. I love this picture. You see, a lot of times we're trying to muster up something that we don't have to defeat sin, defeat fear, defeat doubt. We don't have it in ourselves. What we need to do is not try to motivate ourselves. We need to focus on our champion. We need to put our eyes on our champion, Jesus Christ. See, when you look at our champion, you look at what he did for us, that motivates you. See, to become more than a conqueror, you have to first start with this, that you're not the conqueror. This is the first thing you need to realize to become more than a conqueror, is that you're not the champion. You're not the one who did the work. Jesus is the one who does the work. Jesus is the one. It's, it's replacement. You have to replace it. I think of it like this. 
We got that, got that old house with a lot of problems, and um, I'm constantly in there trying to fix things. And, you know, we, we were pulling out mold the other day, and I was continuing pulling out mold. There's more stuff I find. And every time I pull out something that's dirty or mold or, you know, has old cat urine in it or whatever it is, you know, every time I pull it out, what I do is this. I replace it with something new. I replace it with something new. That's what we need to do with Jesus in our lives. Those areas that are in our lives, if it's anger, if it's lust, if it's pride, if it's fear, if it's doubt, whatever it is, we need to replace it with Jesus. Replace it with Jesus. If I can invite the worship team forward, it looks a lot like this. If you have anger, if you struggle with anger, well, what, how do I get rid of my anger, Tim? What, what does that look like? Replace it with focusing on the love of Christ. If you struggle with gossip, if you love to share dirt, if you love to get on the telephone and say, hey, this is a prayer request, and you start gabbing about all these people's problems, or you like to talk behind people's back and love to, love to bash them, replace it with focusing on how when Jesus was being accused, he said nothing. He said nothing. If you struggle with lust, if you feel like lust, sexual, sexual sin is just too heavy, too strong for you to handle, if it's, if it's overwhelming you, you know what you do? Replace it with reading the Word of God. When that comes, when, that, when those temptations come, replace it with reading the Word of God. I want to share a quick story. I hope my younger brother doesn't mind. He doesn't watch my sermons anyways. So I got my younger brother. He's 18 years old, amazing man of God. He was all-state football. They actually called him. They want him to come to Australia to play football for him. He's really, he's, he's just a stud. But he, he, um, he's like any teenager, and he struggles with lust and things, you know, temptations. And you know what he does? I love this picture. When he struggles with these things, he gets up, and he goes to my dad, and they read the Bible together. Isn't that cool? When he got this temptation come, he goes to my father, and they read the Bible together to defeat it. I love that picture, replacing it, replacing the sin with Jesus, replacing it. If you have a problem with greed or coveting, replace it with focusing on how Jesus gave it all away. Jesus gave everything. If you just want more stuff and more money and more this and more that materialistic, replace it with focusing on how Jesus gave his all. He gave his life. You know, there's even time period in Jesus' life where he was homeless. He was homeless. Pride, if you struggle with pride, replace it on how Jesus became a servant. If you're arrogant and you, you know it all and you, you have all it down and you, you got it all down, replace it with how Jesus became a servant. You see, becoming a conqueror looks a lot like taking your eyes off your Goliath and putting your eyes on your champion. Focusing on your champion, because when you see what Jesus did for us, when we see what he accomplished, it motivates us. It motivates us. This is, when I understood this principle, this is when I found true freedom in my life with sin. And I can honestly stand up here now. I sin, I do struggle um, in areas, a little bit here and there, as we all do. But I can tell you, I am not subject to sin at all. I am not a slave to sin. I'll tell you that very confidently. I am not. Because Jesus completely has set me free. Completely. 100%. I'm telling you, it's amazing. And I used to try and try and try to, you know, get motivated by um, uh, worship songs. And I used to try and I used to strive in myself. And I used to always fail. It used to frustrate me. But when I understood that Jesus is the one that defeated Goliath, the ultimate foe, the ultimate sin, when he did it, that my job is literally just to go have fun and kill the rest of the Philistines. Get rid of the rest of the junk. And the, 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 the number one foes to feed, the, the enemy's on the run. Do you know in our life, the enemy's on the run from Christians? They're afraid of Christians? Because we, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Because of what Jesus has done, greater is he. Jesus Christ is inside of us. Demons have to flee because of Jesus Christ. Christ. And I love these scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we have victory? Through Jesus. Not through ourselves. Not through works. Not through fasting and doing all we can. But through Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 13. I see this on a lot of sports t-shirts. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Through Jesus. Through Jesus, God's desire for Cornerstone Community Church is that they would be full of people that are conquerors, that they're not bound to sin, 
They're not bound to fear. They're not bound to doubt. That's not God's plan for us. Scripture is very clear about that. Christ has come to give us life and life more abundantly. So before we go on and study the rest throughout these weeks about how to be more than a conqueror, we have to first come to the realization that Jesus is our champion, that Jesus has defeated Goliath, that he's our victorious one, that he's the one that did it, and our job is to replace it. Replace what we used to struggle with, things that used to bind us, with Jesus, with Jesus. Focusing on that. And suddenly your cup that used to feel just tainted and your walk with Christ and you always feel guilty, suddenly it just tastes good. It just tastes good all the time. I'm telling you, it tastes good all the time. Because you realize something, that Jesus has paid the price so I can live a victorious life. I'm going to pray and we're going to sing a song about Jesus as Lord. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much. I thank you for the picture of David versus Goliath. God, how it's a picture of the gospel. God, how it's a picture that we're the scared ones. We're the ones that don't got it in us. We've, we've tried and we, we, just, we can't do it, God. And how you come and take our place. And through what you've done, Lord, we're victorious. I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stand for worship.